that plan was torpedoed when, you know, Elon and Sam and Ilya made OpenAI. Uh, why did they make OpenAI? Well, they were worried that they didn't trust Demis to, to handle all that power responsibly when he was in charge of the AI project, you know, the only, you know, when all the fate of the world rested in his hands. So they wanted to create OpenAI to be this countervailing force that could do it right and make it, you know, distributed to everybody and not concentrate power so much in Demis's hands. Um, and in fact, they were the leaked emails or the, the emails that came up in the lawsuit, they were talking about how they were worried that Demis would become dictator using AGI. Are we moving too fast? It's the single most important question of our time, and it's being asked in quiet, urgent conversations in the world's most powerful boardrooms and government offices. The race to build artificial general intelligence, a machine that can reason, learn, and create like a human, is on, and the stakes couldn't be higher. On one side, the promise of a utopia, a world without disease, poverty, or labor. On the other, the risk of an uncontrollable intelligence that could destabilize nations and render humanity obsolete. To understand this high-stakes gamble, we're going deep inside a conversation with three of the world's leading thinkers on AI risk, Daniel Cocotelo, Dan Hendricks, and Gary Marcus. They sit at the epicenter of this debate, and their discussion reveals a chilling tension between what is promised and what is actually happening. So let's start where they do, with the dream. What exactly is the prize everyone is racing for? When you get the AIs that are super intelligent, so what I mean by that is better than the best humans at everything, and also faster and cheaper, uh, you can just completely transform the economy. You know, super intelligent designed robot factories constructed in record speed, producing all these amazing robots and all these amazing new industrial equipment, which then are used to construct new types of factories and new types of laboratories to do all sorts of experiments, to build all sorts of new technologies and blah, 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 blah. Eventually you get, and by eventually, I mean in, in only a few years, uh, you get to a completely automated, wonderful, economy of all sorts of new technologies that have been iterated on and designed by super intelligences, material needs are basically just met for everybody. You know, there's just an incredible abundance of wealth uh, to distribute. And, uh, you know, things like curing all sorts of diseases, uh, putting up new, new settlements on Mars and so forth, all that stuff becomes possible. Um, so that's the sort of like potential, potential upside. And then, of course, there's the question of, uh, can, can we actually achieve that, right? And and if we do have the technology to achieve that, who's in control of the technology? And do they actually use their power over uh, the army of super intelligences to make that sort of broadly distributed good future for everybody? Or do they do something that's more dystopian, you know? Yeah. Um, Incredible abundance, a completely automated, wonderful economy. It's the ultimate techno-optimist vision, the foundational promise that justifies the multi-trillion dollar investment being poured into this technology. But this utopian sales pitch is already colliding with a much messier reality. While we hear of automated economies, a 2023 Goldman Sachs report warns that generative AI could impact 300 million full-time jobs worldwide. The abundance Coco Taylor describes isn't guaranteed to be distributed. In fact, most economic models suggest it could lead to the single greatest consolidation of wealth and power in human history. The core problem, as the speakers acknowledge, isn't just about building the technology, it's about who controls it. And this question of control isn't academic. It's a story of ego, paranoia, and deep-seated mistrust that lies at the very heart of the AI race. And now he's obviously building frontier models. And, and so the, the, the key here is... Um, I guess I would say in a single word, it'd be rationalization. So um, there's been this very seductive argument that has appealed to all of these people, which is basically, well, uh, it's probably going to happen anyway. If we don't do it, someone else will. And it's better for us to do it first than for someone else to do it because we're the responsible good guys who will wisely solve all the safety issues and then also beneficently, you know, uh, give UBI or whatever to, to make sure that everything works out well. So, so basically all of these people sort of trust themselves more than they trust everyone else and have therefore convinced themselves that even though these risks are real, the best way to deal with them is for them to go as fast as possible and win the race. And this is, you know, DeepMind's plan, so to speak, Demis Hassabis, his plan was basically be there, get there first with this big corporation, Google, and then, uh, 
because you have such a lead over everybody else, you can sort of slow down and get all the safety stuff right and sort of make sure that everything goes well before everybody else catches up. That seems naive. That plan was torpedoed when, you know, Elon and Sam and Ilya made OpenAI. Uh, why did they make OpenAI? Well, they were worried that they didn't trust Demis to, to handle all that power responsibly when he was in charge of the AI project, you know, the only, you know, when all the fate of the world rested in his hands. So they wanted to create OpenAI to be this countervailing force that could do it right and make it you know, distributed to everybody and not concentrate power so much in Demis's hands. Um, and in fact, they were the leaked emails or the, the emails that came up in the lawsuit. They were talking about how they were worried that Demis would become dictator using AGI. Um, and uh, well, we can see how well that's worked out. You know, uh, all the anthropic people basically split off from OpenAI because they didn't think OpenAI was going to handle the safety stuff responsibly. So then they're claiming that like they have the technical talent and they'll be able to like sort out the alignment issues better than everyone else. You know, uh, it's a mess. Dictator using AGI? Let that sink in. This isn't just business competition. It's a personal, almost existential rivalry built on the fear of what one person might do with godlike power. This clip reveals the founding myth of the AI safety movement, that we are the responsible ones and they are not. This exact dynamic exploded into public view in late 2023 with the firing and rehiring of OpenAI CEO Sam Altman. The board, citing a mission to ensure AGI benefits all humanity, tried to stop him. But the immense pressure from investors and staff driven by the need for speed and profit forced his return. It was a real-world stress test of safety versus progress. And progress won, decisively. This corporate infighting is a microcosm of a much larger, more dangerous conflict. The fear of a rival CEO becoming a dictator is now scaled up to the fear of a rival nation dominating the globe. I think the asks are instead uh, having, um, say for instance, the United States disrupt China's ability to develop a superintelligence, the main way in which they would develop it is if they get uh, the ability to automate AI research and development fully and take the human out of the loop. Then you go from machine speed or from human speed to machine speed. And we've had people such as Dario, for instance, uh, the CEO of Anthropic, talk about how that will give the USA or such a such a, um, an, a recursive process like that. Uh, could lead to an intelligence explosion, and that would lead to a durable edge where nobody will be able to catch up. And last week, uh, Sam Altman discussed how this process could telescope a decade's worth of AI development in a year or potentially a month. And I think that's extraordinarily destabilizing for two reasons. One, if they control it, then, or if a state controls it, such as, say, China, uh, then uh, all the other countries are at substantial risk uh, because that superintelligence could be weaponized and used to crush other countries. And uh, if they don't control it, which I think would be fairly likely by a nearly unsupervised, extremely fast-moving process, um, uh, uh, then everybody's survival is also threatened. So either way, this uh, very fast automated AI R&D loop is, is quite uh, destabilizing whether a state controls it or not. And so I think it makes sense, uh, not just because you know, AI is, is, is scary or in some vague sense, but I think that there are very strong geopolitical incentives for a state self-preservation to prevent I mean, that. A durable edge, that's the key phrase. Hendrix is describing the ultimate strategic prize, an intelligence explosion, a recursive loop where an AI begins improving itself at a speed no human can comprehend. The first nation to achieve this would, in theory, have an insurmountable advantage in economics, espionage, and warfare. And this isn't a future scenario. It is happening right now. The U.S. Commerce Department sweeping export controls, banning the sale of advanced chips like NVIDIA's H100 to China, are a direct attempt to do exactly what Hendricks describes, disrupt and slow down a competitor. It's a cold war fought with silicon, a global race fueled by the fear that if you don't build it first, your adversary will. So if the geopolitical and corporate pressures are forcing us to run at full speed, how close are we really? This is where the experts fundamentally disagree, exposing a deep chasm in how we even measure progress. For example, if you had 10 to the 45 floating point operations, you could do a, a training run that's basically just simulating the entire planet Earth and all life evolving on it for a billion years, you know, with that amount of compute. And, and, and the thought there is that 
you don't really need to understand how intelligence works at all if you're building it with that type of training run because there's no in insight coming from you. It's you're just sort of letting nature do its thing and letting like, evolution do take its course. And so this is the core of the entire conflict. On one hand, you have the scaling hypothesis that with enough data and computing power, intelligence will simply emerge. We don't need to understand the principles. We just need to build bigger models. The rapid leap from GPT-3 to the multimodal gpt 4 which can see, hear, and speak, seems to prove this point. Progress feels exponential. But Gary Marcus represents the other side, arguing that we're mistaking impressive performance for genuine understanding. He points to the qualitative problems, the cognitive gaps, and we see evidence of this everywhere. AI models still hallucinate, confidently inventing facts. They fail at simple common-sense reasoning that a child could perform. So we have a paradox, a technology that is advancing at a breathtaking rate, yet remains fundamentally brittle and unreliable. Which brings us to the most frightening question of all. Even if we can build it, can we control it? The alignment problem. It's the challenge of ensuring an AI's goals are aligned with our own. Marcus's point is devastatingly simple. If we can't even get a model to reliably follow the rules of a simple board game, how can we possibly trust it with the complex, ambiguous, and high-stakes rules of human society? This isn't a future problem. The recent wave of AI-generated deepfake robocalls in political elections is a perfect example of alignment failure in the wild. We have built systems we cannot fully control, and they are already being used to undermine the foundations of our democracies. This leads to the final and perhaps most disruptive idea in the entire discussion. What if this entire path, the path of ever larger language models, is a dead end? What about the superhuman coder milestone? Do you think that that won't be happening in the next decade, probably? I don't remember how you define the milestone. Basically, think about like these coding agents like Claude and so forth, but imagine that they just like actually work to the point where you can just treat them like a software engineer and chat with them and give them high-level instructions, and they'll just do as good a job as a very professional, excellent software engineer would have done. So I think apprentice engineer, we're actually close already. Well, I mean um, top. I mean, but top. top software engineer, I don't think we're close. I, I think that that requires an understanding of the problem, what humans want solved by the problem. It under requires a deep understanding of various domains. I just don't think that we're that close to that when there will be a state change. But I think in 2035, we will look at LLMs and be like, nice try. We still use them for some things, but that wasn't really the answer. Um, I think Jan LeCun would say the same thing, again, in, despite our differences. I think we both think LLMs are not really the route to AGI, and that when we get there, it's going to look pretty different. It might use LLMs. They're great at kind of distributional learning. It might replace them <clears throat> because they're very inefficient in terms of energy and data. So somebody might find a better way to do the same kind of thing of, of learning the models of distributions of things, which is a super helpful cognitive skill. It's not the only one, but it's super helpful. But we'll have much better ways of doing reasoning and planning. We'll have much more stable world models. Nice try. Marcus is suggesting that the current approach is not just flawed, but fundamentally unsustainable. And the data supports this. The energy required to train a single large AI model can have a carbon footprint equivalent to hundreds of transatlantic flights. The data needed is exhausting the entire public internet. Perhaps the current path won't lead to AGI, but will instead collapse under its own economic and environmental weight, forcing a pivot to more efficient, structured approaches like the neurosymbolic AI he describes. So here we are, caught in a race we may not understand, for a prize that could either be utopia or ruin. We are driven by the very human flaws of fear and ego, building systems we fundamentally cannot control on a technological path that might not even be the right one. The central question remains, are we moving too fast? After listening to those on the inside, it's hard not to feel that the real question is, do we even know where we are going? The debate over AGI is often framed as a technical problem, but as we've seen, it's deeply human. Given that the race is fueled as much by mistrust and geopolitical fear as it is by scientific curiosity, is a global cooperative slowdown even possible? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. If this analysis gave you a new perspective, consider liking this video and subscribing for more deep dives into the technology shaping our future.